Hello and welcome to lesson 19 of Negotiate Value. Are you a little sad because we only have two lessons left? Well, that's okay. I'm a little sad too. It's been quite a journey together. So much of what we've learned has been getting ready for the negotiation, understanding the components of value for both the buyer and the seller, knowing what drives your benefit and the different pieces inside of that, understanding what our options are and developing our options so we have more. And it's only in this last module that we're actually negotiating. We're actually in the process of talking to the other side, figuring out what the price is, what the terms are, figuring out how to actually capture that value and bring it home. Now, everything before in the first three modules has been necessary preparation. It's enabled us to get our skills ready, get our thinking right, so we can actually capture the most value when it comes down to the main event. It's almost like it's been a sport. We've been practicing all off season and now we're ready for the season to begin, or like a play we've been rehearsing for for months, and now it's opening night. So whatever your metaphor, this is what really matters. This is actually following through on what we've learned to execute and to capture value when you're talking to the other side and performing an actual negotiation with real dollars, real time, real resources at stake. Now, this lesson, 19, is about sharpening the pencil. What do we mean by that? We mean having the second round conversation. Once you get a bid, once you get a price offer, that's not necessarily the end of the conversation. Now, if you're selling to lots of people and you have a set price for your offering and it's not really scarce, then you probably don't have a lot of multiple rounds of negotiating. For example, if I'm selling a car for $30,000 and somebody comes in and says, okay, I'll pay $30,000 for that car, well, that's it for the negotiating. I'm not gonna go back and say, no, no, pay $32,000 because that wouldn't work. But if you're selling something that's scarce to multiple buyers, or whenever you're buying and have multiple suppliers, then you can absolutely have a second round conversation. And not only can you have it, but you should have it because this drives so much of the value. This is where in one single action in just a day or two or a few hours of conversation, you can get 10%, 15%, 20%, sometimes even more, more value from the negotiation. This is where you might take the um, best supplier that's also the highest price and get them to a point where they're the best supplier at the lowest price. So that's much more value for you. So it's exciting to put this into play. And I wanna tell you that in my experience as a consultant, this is where I help bring tons of value to my clients and this is what I get paid to do. Because again, it's in this negotiating, then the difference between the first price you see and the final price you pay the first value that you see and the final value that you get, that's where you gain so much from successful negotiating. That's what we're going to do. This lesson is packed. Um, I want to explain and sort of show and tell at the same time. So let me show, let me demonstrate to you by an example that probably we all have some familiarity with. And let's say that you're buying a new website. You need to build a new website for your company and you've bid it out. And by whatever methods, whether it's a formal RFP or just talking to a few vendors, you've got some proposals on the table. You've got some bids. Three from the blue company, the orange company, and the yellow company. We're making this up, but well, let's understand that these are the bids. And we've taken a look at them and we've analyzed where the costs are. And we've broken that down into a few different categories. There are costs for designing the website. There are costs for actually developing, building the website. And then there are costs for support for ongoing maintenance. So that, or that's our basic cost model that sort of breaks out the cost components of this project. Now let's look at the specific bids that we got. For the blue company, they bid $40,000 for design, again $40,000 for development, and $10,000 for support. Now let's look at the orange company. They bid just $15,000 for design, $35K for development, and $20,000 for support. And the yellow company gave us a proposal that looked a little different. They had their design and development bundled together and they didn't have anything for support and the total was $70,000. And that's what happens in fact. Sometimes you bid out something and you want to see sort of apples and apples, but what comes back doesn't all fit inside your box. So you have to adjust for that. So we've done that in this cost model and we've done one more thing that's really important. And that is in the bottom row here, we take a look at the quality of the solution. And as a surrogate, just as a shortcut, we've put in uh, plus signs to symbolize how high the quality is. So the blue company solution got three stars, orange got two stars, and yellow also got two stars. So we're not just looking at the cost, we're looking at the different components of the cost, and we're also looking at some semblance of the benefit. And that's what the quality solution, that bottom row, is supposed to symbolize. Now, 
let's talk about the goals of going to a second round. So those are suppliers, that's what they told us. What do we wanna get out of the second round? We wanna get more value. That probably means lower prices and that may mean more benefit as well. And we also wanna get a better understanding. Now, this is a, a key thing to remember whenever you're giving second round feedback or third round, it's not just an opportunity to push the price down, it's an important chance for you to learn more about what the seller is offering when you're buying or what the buyer's offering when you're selling. It's really important to keep those two things going forward together and we'll explain why a little bit in a little bit more detail in just a second. Let's also talk about some guidelines for negotiating and for going back in that second round. And the first one, I don't really need to tell you, but never lie. So if you're not motivated by honesty, uh, let me tell you that lying or being uh, mistruthful in, in negotiating is gonna come up and catch you. So it's not for your success and it's also dishonest. So never lie. And I would add, don't bluff. Um, now, if you've taken this course, especially if you went through the last module about push the potential, we know how to develop options. We know how to find some when there really aren't any and how to put yourself in a position where you have great options. Now, because of that, you really don't need to bluff. But I don't encourage you to bluff. Bluffing is for poker pros. I'm not that good. I don't bluff and I don't encourage you to either. Um, this is a little more tactical, but I wouldn't share any other vendor's pricing with somebody else. So when somebody sends you a proposal or tells you what a price would be, then you talk to another vendor and they say, well, what'd you hear elsewhere? Uh, I would resist ever giving a specific price back to that vendor. This actually helps you tactically because you can say it as your policy. You can say, well, you know what? I, we never give out pricing of what other vendors tell us. And by the way, I won't give any, I won't give your pricing to anybody else. So it's a great policy to have as a blanket. And I strongly encourage that. It works well for me. It'll work well for you too. And then finally, don't provide a meet or beat price. That is, don't say, look, if you get to 40,000, we'll buy it, or the price has to be 26 cents per unit. What that, what that means when you make that statement is you are really promising that you're gonna follow through and buy if they make that price. You're, gonna pro you're promising that you'll follow through and make the deal. So there are times when I've used this in the past, there are times when it may be advantageous for you to do that. If you're selling something and you wanna say, look, if you give me 20,000, I'll just sell it to you. But keep in mind that whenever you do that, you have to follow through and honor that agreement. And if you have multiple options in play, which I really hope you do, then you will close off those options by offering somebody a price that you've given a bond to follow through on. So those are the guidelines. What are we actually gonna tell these vendors? Let's start with the blue company. And I'll go through the feedback that I would give if I were buying, and we'll walk through it point by point. Now, the first thing I'd say to the blue company is that their overall price is extremely uncompetitive. If you look at the other bids, 70,000, theirs is almost 30% higher. I wouldn't tell them that number, I wouldn't tell them what the low bids were, but I'd say extremely uncompetitive, and if they pushed, I'd give them some sort of range. I'd say, well, that means between 20 and 50% higher than what we're seeing in the marketplace. The next thing I'd ask is what assumptions are behind the design phase? Why does it look so high compared to the others? And I'd actually give them the feedback that it was t more than twice as much what the market showed and what we expected. Now, this could be helpful because you wanna have a conversation and push back on those assumptions. They might think that you need a lot more help in design than you actually do. So you wanna press on those assumptions and understand what they are. Finally, I'd ask what's included in the support fees. That looks like the low bid for support compared to the orange company. In fact, it's half as much. But that sort of raises a question for me. Why is it diff does the number look so different? And does it include the things that I need it to include? So if that's not explicitly spelled out in the bid they gave me, I want to press down more and understand exactly what's behind that. Let's look next at the orange company. The first thing I tell them is their design and development fees are somewhat competitive. Okay, now you may be wondering, why do I say somewhat competitive when it looks like they're the low bid? Well, we don't know how this negotiation is gonna unfold. We don't know what the next rounds are going to bring. So I wanna be very wary of telling the orange company or any vendor that they have the low bid. What I don't mind telling them is that they're somewhat competitive, but that still kind of keeps the pressure on. It gives them impetus to maybe see if they can sharpen things a little further and press down on their price. And it means that they're not resting on the bid that they have. Because again, we don't know what will happen. And if I say that they're competitive, they have the low price, that might give them the sense that they don't need to do anything, that they're good where they are. Now, the next thing I'd say is their support fees are extremely uncompetitive. Again, twice as much what the other, uh, what the blue company offered. 
But I'd ask, what assumptions are behind that? What is it that's spelled out and included in that support? And I want to get that item by item. And then finally, I tell them that this is not a compelling value at the pricing that we see. In other words, we're not quite buying it. Now, again, you're saying, but this is the low bid, or it looks like one of the low bids. So how can this not be compelling? Well, there are a few different ways. First of all, by definition, we're continuing on with this process of talking to multiple vendors and going through another round. So we don't have a slam dunk yet. We haven't seen something that says, okay, let's stop the process and go with these guys. They're the ones. So that, that's one of the key reasons. Competitively, we're still ongoing. And so it's not compelling enough to move to action. And then secondly, remember that we're not necessarily talking just about price. This is negotiate value, right? And we all know about the difference between the benefit and the, um, and the price you pay, and that's the value you get. So you might have looked at this as a company and said, boy, if we can make this website for forty or $50,000, that would be great. And $70,000 seems to be the low bid, but that's still not really a compelling value for us because it's really just not worth that much. So when you're talking about value in the absolute, it doesn't necessarily matter what the relative bids are. It's that you're looking at the overall value. So that's an important message to send really to all your, your vendors is that where things are, it's not a compelling value. Now, if we go to the yellow company, I'd start with the same message for all the same reasons. Say, hey, this is not a compelling value at this pricing. Then I'd ask, well, well, I'd let them know that the design and development fees were extremely uncompetitive. If you look at versus the orange company, they're about 40% more. Again, extremely uncompetitive. And I'd ask them to break out that pricing. Vendors won't always give you pricing the way you want it, but you should ask them for it. As say, if you want to see the design and development broken out, then ask them for that. If you want to see more components, more modular, go ahead and ask them for that because it helps you understand where their costs are and it can help find things that you might be able to eliminate. That would help them to win the business. It would help you because you'd pay less. And then finally, I'd ask more about the support. And the way I'd position this would not be to say, hey, you didn't charge us for support because that sort of tips them off that they can add another fee into the proposal. But I'd simply say, well, is support included? What's included? How long? What are the different components? Because it may well be that they've assumed something as part of the price that you hadn't assumed or that other vendors hadn't. So don't prompt them to charge you more. Simply ask if something should be there that's not there or something is there but isn't explicitly stated. Okay, now let's run through these messages that we've given to the vendors. The first piece is the value is not enough. We want all of them to be hungry, to be realizing that we're still looking for a better deal for more value, for lower pricing, for more to get. Finally, we've given them, or again, we've given them feedback in a way that's useful to them. Pricing feedback in a specific area that's modular so they know what component it relates to, and they also have some sense of the magnitude of where they stand in comparison with the marketplace. We question their assumptions because we want to understand what's behind those prices they're giving us. And that's a chance to talk about value. What is it that we really value that's important to us? And if we can knock out things that are cost for them but they don't drive our benefit, then again, everybody wins all around. And then finally, we've asked them to respond. So this is what we've done with these vendors and this um, illustration. And it's also what I want you to do uh, for the homework. Now, no matter where you find a vendor to give feedback, I want to ask that as homework for this, in the next week, you find a vendor that you can give feedback. So this could be in the corporate setting. It could be a consulting project you're buying or an offer, uh, a copy or lease that you're buying. Or gosh, it could be even going to the gap and giving feedback on some jeans that you're buying and why you're not buying them. So no matter what it is, the, the exercise of giving feedback, giving information to somebody who's selling and being able to tell them, hey, this isn't really working for us in terms of the value and here's why, that's such an important skill to have. And as I mentioned earlier, you can get 10 to 15 to 20%, sometimes more, of reduction in price or increase in value simply by going through this feedback step. So it's a critical piece of negotiating. You need to be good at it, you need to be comfortable at it, and you need to practice. That's the homework this week. Go and find a place and let's run through the process one more time. So what you want to do is analyze the components of the cost and understand that. Then prepare your pricing feedback. And I would give that in terms like we discussed. Highly competitive, uncompetitive, etc. Then prepare your questions in writing so you have it written down and you know what you're going to communicate to the other party. Rehearse the conversation so you say only what you want to say and you don't say anything that might weaken your leverage or might send the wrong message to the other party. And even to, to enforce that, I would actually send them written feedback and then maybe review that written feedback on the phone because, again, you want to control how you communicate and really not say the wrong thing. 
And finally, give them a time frame to respond because you're giving this information so they can use it. You want them to have a better chance of coming back to you and getting the deal. That's good for them and that's good for you if it turns out to be more value all around. And we've talked about this from the buyer point of view, but this process generally works for a seller as well. If you have multiple bidders and um, the components may be different, and if you're selling something, it might really come down to just the price, but often there are other components to the price as well, such as uh, delivery terms or financing terms, or maybe there's some service components to what they're buying. These are different levers that you can pull and different things that you can play with to get a better deal, to get more surplus for yourself. And that's really where we end here at Lesson 19. It's about capturing surplus. We're going to uh, round things out in the final lesson next, the next time in Lesson 20. So I'll see you then. Okay, still watching? <laughs> well, I've got an offer for you, and it's actually a special graduation gift. Uh, I mentioned that when you talk to the vendor about this, it shouldn't be adversarial. It shouldn't be something where it's highly emotional or you're telling them they're wrong or you're fighting about it. Actually, it's a conversation that really can help them and can help you and it should be cooperative. Now, I've written a book about this uh, with Ian Allman, who's a great friend and uh, the Grow My Revenue um, leader. And Ian's a uh, national uh, trainer for salespeople and had uh, incredible success and in, in teaching companies how to sell better. So he's from the selling side. I, as you know, are more from the buying side. But our point here is that those shouldn't be enemies. We should be talking together and buying in a more collaborative fashion. And that will help everybody negotiate better. And this book will help you. So if you'd like a copy, send me a note. And as long as I have some left, I've got a bunch earmarked for this purpose. But I'd really like to give you a gift for coming this far, for uh, getting close to graduating. Uh, so thanks. Send me a note. I look forward to uh, hearing from you, sending the book, and staying in touch.